Our guest today has been called the biggest money earner in the mob since Al Capone. Michael Francis grew up as the son of the notorious underboss of the feared Colombo crime family. At his most affluent, he generated five to eight million dollars per week from legal and illegal businesses. Avoiding traditional mob domains, Michael masterminded brilliant scams on the edge of the legitimate business world. From auto dealerships and financial services to the sports and entertainment industries, and eventually to a multi-billion dollar tax scam, he became one of the biggest money makers in mob history. Michael is the only high-ranking official of a major crime family to ever walk away without protective custody and survive. We're looking forward to discussing his fascinating life, lessons learned over that time, and the many applications we can take from life in the mob to the world of business, sales, and entrepreneurship. Michael, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the Run GPG podcast. Thanks for having me. You know, Mike, Michael, you know, we've interviewed a lot of interesting high profile guests, influencers, celebrities. However, you're somebody I really wanted to talk to for a minute now because you have such a unique perspective on a business, in, you know, from a perspective that we, a lot of us won't get to see, you know, under the hood of, right? Uh, if we want to call it an industry coming from the world you have, thankfully, we won't have a close look at it. But according to your bio, you know, in reading your bio, it says you are the only high ranking official of a major crime family to walk away publicly without witness protection and actually survive and tell your story. Is that, is that accurate? Is that an accurate statement? Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, uh, I don't believe anybody has been able to, you know, walk away, not cooperate with the government, uh, not enter a witness protection program and live as high profile as I have. So, you know, to my knowledge, there's, there's nobody else around. Like well, it's an interesting statistic, if it's true. <laughs> you know, we mentioned in the intro that you were generating five to $8 million a week from some of your business ventures. However, there was an article in Fortune Magazine, an infamous article from many years ago now, that ranked the highest earning mafia bosses in history. And you were among them. You were among the highest earners. I think you were in the top 20, if I remember. In that article, it said that you were, as I said in the, you know, the intro, you were called the biggest money earner in the mob since Al Capone. Is that accurate? Like, how do they know this? First of all, do they look at tax return? Like, how do they know? No, I guarantee they didn't. Uh, they didn't check my tax return. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have found much if they did. But you know, I don't know how they make that ranking. But you know, quite honestly, the uh, the gas tax scam, we'll call it, that I was. Um, you know, instrumental in developing was probably one of the biggest money earners that uh, certainly the Colombo family had. And I think all of the mob in New York, uh, you know, since the days of prohibition. I mean, it was a, a huge, huge, huge enterprise that we created. And the money was extremely significant, you know, several million dollars a week. And uh, it lasted for quite some time. Yeah, really interesting. I do want to talk to you about that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. But obviously, from those statistics, you know, you are someone who knows a thing or two about making money, or as you say in your book, taking money. So it will be interesting to get your perspective on the tactics and philosophies used in the mob to apply to legitimate business owners, entrepreneurs, sales professionals. But first, I do want to set the stage and paint the picture for our listeners and give our conversation some context, as I was mentioning, by hearing your backstory. So where are you from and where did you grow up? Grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, my dad, Sonny Francis, you know, was born in Naples. Uh, my mom was also of Italian descent, so Italian on both sides. And I grew up in uh, the Greenpoint section of Brooklyn and lived there for, uh, you know, quite a few years of my young life Then moved out to Long Island, New York, and, and spent most of my time out there. And, uh, you know, my dad was a major figure. He was the underboss of the Colombo family, one of the five New York, uh, you know, Cosa Nostra families. And so I grew up under that influence. Um, my dad was extremely high profile, major target of law enforcement, major presence in that life. So I grew up around, you know, that uh, atmosphere where my dad was always under surveillance and always getting arrested and so on and so forth. He didn't want that life for me. He wanted me to have an education, go to school, actually wanted me to be a doctor. And uh, so that's where I was headed, you know, until my dad got in some really serious trouble. Uh, long story short, after several trials that he was acquitted on, he was convicted in federal court for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies, sentenced to 50 years in prison, and went off to do his time in 1970. And um, I, at that time, was a, uh, I was a pre-med student at Hofstra University when dad went in, but that's when things started to make a, a radical change in my life. Yeah, really interesting. And we'll get there. Now, the history of the Colombo crime family, can you give us just a brief history? Because I believe it, the Colombo crime family started in the 40s, if I'm not mistaken. And, and it wasn't originally called the Colombo crime family. Like, how did it get its name? Yeah, no, it was, uh, well, you got to understand all of uh, 
the organization of Cosa Nostra in this country really started with, with Lucky Luciano when he divided the, uh, the families into, uh, you know, various families throughout the uh, United States and created the Mob Commission. So it was really in the 40s that all of the families were d divided up and formed. And the Colombo family was originally the Profaci family. Joe Profaci was the original boss of that family. And my dad was under him uh, as he came up during that time. Then Joe Colombo took over and my dad uh, became his underboss at one point in time. So that's how it started. And so they took the name from Joe Colombo. And is it true that Joe Colombo was shot next to you? Like he was shot and you were next to him. Is that true? Yeah, he was. It was an assassination attempt. Uh, we had a big rally, the Italian American Civil Rights League rally. It was in Manhattan at Columbus Circle, and uh, I was uh, only a few steps away from him when the you know the shots rang out and he was hit. Uh, he didn't die immediately, but he was uh, in a coma for almost seven years before he died. But yeah, that was a very dramatic day in my life. It was the first time I witnessed something as uh, you know as dramatic as that. I would say. No kidding. Um, okay, so let's get into the meat of it here. Can you tell us how uh, mafia families, crime families are actually structured? Because this is really interesting how they're actually structured. It's fairly simple, but they do have a, a definite structure to them. Yeah, and I would say one of the reasons that, uh, you know, the mob survived and prospered under some, you know, very challenging conditions was because of the structure, because of the discipline, uh, because of the respect. And the way the families are divided up, there's uh, you have a boss, an underboss, who's his right hand man. You have a consigliere, who is the advisor to the boss, advisor to the family. Then you have capo regimes or captains. Uh, they're appointed by the boss. And then under the capo regimes, you have soldiers. And soldiers are uh, the lowest rank, uh, but they're made men. They've actually taken the oath. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have associates. They have not taken the oath, and they're normally, you know, trusted or, you know, as, as much as you can trust somebody that uh, you bring into your crew. But that's the structure. There's no lieutenants or sergeants or anything like that. And, uh, you know, unlike in The Godfather, where uh, Tom Hagen was the consigliere to the family, that's not true. Because in order to have that position, in order to be a made man and take the oath, your father must be Italian. Your mom can be of a different descent, but your dad must be Italian. So, uh, that's the heritage. And obviously, it originated from the mafia in Italy. So is it fair to say that you joined that life or the mafia because of a driving force to get your dad out of prison and vindicate your father? I read that somewhere, right? Is that what's yeah, no, that was the entire reason? I mean, when my dad went away for 50 years, um, I lost interest in school. Joe Colombo had kind of taken me under his wing. Mm -hmm. So I started to you know, hang out with a lot of my dad's friends in the early part of my uh, college and lost interest in school and said, you know, I visited my dad. He was in Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas. So it was a, you know, a high security institution. And I said, dad, you know, you were framed. I believe until this day, I'll take it to my deathbed that my dad was framed on that case. He wasn't uh, a bank robber. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, if I don't help you out, you're going to die in here. So, you know, uh, I lost interest in school. We needed money for lawyers. We needed to track down the witnesses, get them to recant their testimony. We had to see why the government was complicit in framing my father. So that's a lot of work. And my dad, during that meeting, you know, he said, OK, but if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. And in his mind, the right way was to become a member of his life. So he proposed me, formally proposed me for membership at that point in time. And I was 21 years old. That's how it started for me. Was this everything happening during prison? Your conversations with your father was all, all through prison? Yeah, I mean, he had, he had uh, went into prison in 1970. Uh, this conversation took place in 71. So he was in for just about a year. And that's when Joe Colombo, I don't know if you're aware of that, he started that whole Italian-American Civil Rights League when he was you know, claiming that Italian Americans were being harassed. They had uh, arrested his son, Joey Jr., on what he thought was a trumped up charge. And we started picketing the FBI building. You know, we were out there on a picket line on 69th Street and 3rd Avenue. And I was the first one, you know, down there, one of the first ones, because I thought it would be a way to help my father because my father was framed. So now I'm starting to meet with all the guys and Joe Colombo's having a strong influence on me. And, you know, I already hated the police uh, growing up, you know, believing that they were the enemy because they were always trying to harass my dad and my family. So, you know, it's all those things that kind of work together that brought me to the decision that, it's not about school. It's about getting my dad out of prison. I mean, he was 50 years old when he went in. He had 50 on top of that. I figured that's a death sentence. He'll never come out alive. So, I mean, I, I had to do something. 
Was there something that your father kept on repeating to you as a mantra or, or a, a statement to take with you along your journey in becoming who you became? Well, yeah. I mean, once I you know, was part of that life, then my father would tutor me or counsel me. And you know, he was a master of the life. I mean, he knew it you know, as well or better than anybody. So he, you know, he would tell me basically how to survive. Because I, I will tell you this, if you're a member of that life, and you die of old age, and you die free, you've really accomplished something, because it's a rough life to navigate. So my dad would give me pointers, like he told me, he said, Mike, always be, be slow to speak. He said, always be a good listener. When people are talking to you, when you're in a sit down, when you're in a business negotiation, make sure you listen carefully to what somebody has to say before you, uh, you, know, you speak and respond. He said, let them commit themselves first. Why? He, he told me another thing, he said, you know, you're going to be in situations where people are going to be in trouble in that life and they're going to ask for your opinion. He said, always be the last one to condemn somebody. Don't be the first. He said, because that life is like a wheel. And one day you're going to be on the spot. And if people remember you being the first one to condemn, well, you're going to be the first one to be condemned. Mm -hmm. And that's serious in that life. So, you know, just those two things uh, really helped me navigate some treacherous situations that I was in. And, um, you know, he told me to treat it now. Do you use it now personally? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you know, in negotiations when I'm in business, you know, I always look at it this way. There's sometimes I can go into a meeting and I know that I'm the smartest person in the room, but I don't want anybody else to know that. Let them talk, let them educate, let them think they're educating me and I'll actually play. Well, yeah, tell me all about it. Let them just spill their guts. Tell me everything I need to know. And then at the very end, I know exactly what I'm going to do, exactly what I want. This guy has led me into his, his life, so to speak. And then there's other times when I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I want everybody to think I am. So the way I do that is I kind of keep my mouth shut and just say certain things at the appropriate time. And people, they don't know what you're thinking. And they say, wow, this guy may know more than I think he knows. So, you know, a lot of things like that have really helped, you know, in a legitimate life later on. So we see this in the movies. It's, it's becoming a made man in the mafia. You became a made man at what age? I was 24. 24. And can you tell us about that ceremony? It's fascinating, actually. What, what was it? Like, can you walk us through that? Yeah, it was, um, it's obviously a very secure meeting. You know, I had been a recruit. I'm making my way trying to get, you know, let people understand that I'm, I'm worthy to be a member. And, um, you know, you don't know when it's going to happen because it is a secret ceremony. They don't tell you. And then one day I'm told, hey, you know, meet me down at Carroll Street. That was the headquarters of the Colombo family at that time when Persico had taken over. And so I went there on October 31st, um, like any other day. But I had a, kind of got the sense that something else was going on. And basically that night uh, I was brought to a, a catering hall that was owned by Joe Colombo's son, Anthony Colombo, called the Casa Bella. It was in Brooklyn, secure place. And with five other guys that night at about midnight, we all walked into a room individually and took an oath. And the way that happens is um, the, you walk into a room, it's dimly lit, late at night. They want you to understand the seriousness of what you're getting involved in. Uh, boss is seated like the head of a horseshoe configuration, underboss, consigliere to his left and right. And all the captains are allowed to uh, come in on that ceremony. And uh, I walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss, held out my hand. He took a knife, cut my finger. Some blood dropped on the floor. This is a blood oath. Cupped my hands, took a picture of a saint, Catholic altar card, put it in my hands and lit it aflame. It didn't hurt. It burned quickly. It was merely symbolic. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life, into Cosa Nostra. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers, and you will die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. Do you accept? Yes, I do. And that's it. And then you're made. You're a made man. And uh, the other five guys went in, they all took the oath, and that's how it starts. That's incredibly dramatic, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even though you describe it in just a few minutes, it's uh, very dramatic. Now, you're, you're, you're on the streets. Sorry, you're on the streets. Um, you're a made man. Where did you start to make your money now? Well, you know, I, I realized even while I was a recruit that I had a little bit of a head for business. Um, you know, I had gotten involved. My dad, when I was younger, uh, he had bought into an auto body shop and I started working there and I started, you know, just figuring different things out that I had the ways I could make money in there. I had that kind of entrepreneurial spirit early on. 
Uh, I ended up uh, buying a Mazda agency uh, when you couldn't give a Mazda away because their engines were blowing up, the Wankel engines. <laughs> and, um, you know, then I did a couple of things on the street that, you know, I mean, it would take time to get into it. But I realized that I had a head for business. So, you know, once I became a made guy, you, you kind of have two, two levels in that life. And you, you make your way in either level, meaning that if you're an earner, and you're bringing in good money to the family and the boss is earning, your capo regime is earning. Well, they want to keep you in that category. You're an earner. You know, they, everybody loves money in that life. And if you're not in that category, you know, you might be a guy that's you're a better worker. Maybe you can shake down a business, maybe have a gambling problem. Well, you're in another category and you do most of the work, you know, because they want to preserve the guys that are the earners. Not to say that you're not responsible for doing work if you're called upon. And I think you know what I mean when you're doing work. Uh, everybody's qualified and everybody has to do it when they're called upon. But um, like I said, if you're an earner, you kind of get to that different level in that life. Yeah. And you were loaning money, correct? Yeah. I mean, I was a Shylock. I mean, everybody in that life that's, uh, that's got a few bucks, you end up putting money out on the street. Yes. Okay. Now... You're starting to make a name for yourself. You're making some money. You're entrepreneurial. Uh, Then you come up with the big one that you referenced at the beginning of our discussion. That's the one that put you on uh, the charts, right? It's the highest earning, one of the highest earning criminals in American history. What was the scheme you came up with? It was, it had to do with gas. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people think that they have this misinterpretation or this uh, misimpression that mob guys sit around in their social clubs and they look at the next business that they're going to defraud or attack. And that happens on occasion, but most of the time, it's somebody within a business that comes to us, they got some kind of plan that they want to do, and they figure we can help them, we can protect them, we can give them money, we can assist them, we got connections. So with the gas business, it kind of happened that way. There was a guy out in Long Island who had a small gas operation, uh, he had a couple of gas stations, and two guys from another family were extorting him, they were shaking him down. So he comes to me for help. And he tells me, you know, with your help, I think I can devise a scheme where we can defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. Well, I didn't like the government back then, so that was kind of music to my ears. So um, I said, okay, we're going we're gonna to have a little relationship here. And I, I got rid of the guys that were bothering him. I mean, I made them go away. I didn't get technically rid of them. <laughs> and because uh, I was kind of the guy on Long Island. And we go into business together, form a company. And um, I put a guy alongside of him that was very close to me, one of my crew guys, and he was a butcher, big guy with a big scar across his head, a foreboding looking guy, right? And I said, Vinny, this guy's name was Larry. I said, watch, Larry, let's see if we really got something here. So about a week and a half later, you know, Vinny comes to my house on a Saturday. He used to come every Saturday and bring me meat. He was my butcher, right? So he's got a box on his shoulder and he opened the door and I said, what are we having a party? You're bringing me all this meat. I don't know anything about it. He says, no, it ain't meat, chief. He said, come on in the kitchen. I want to show you something. He puts the box down on a table. He opens it up, $320,000. And he said, this is the first week, weeks, week and a half take in the gas business. It smelled like gasoline, right? All the money. I didn't care what it smelled like. But basically he got my attention at that point and you know, over the next seven or eight years, we grew that 320,000 to 350 gas stations, uh, 18 companies licensed to collect tax on a gallon of gasoline. And we would bring in five, eight, ten million dollars a week, whatever, you know, whatever deals we were making during that time. So uh, it became a very lucrative operation. I brought a lot of the Russian mob guys from Brighton Beach were my partners. And when I brought them in, we expanded considerably. They were pretty, pretty uh, sharp guys too. And I ran that for eight years. Well, how many gas stations did you end up with? Well, we had about 350 I either owned or operated, but we were selling gas to, you know, well over a thousand stations because even the branded stations like Mobile, or I don't know what you have in Canada, you know, all the big names, BP, Mobile, uh, Shell Oil, we'd go to the station and we tell them, you know, listen, how many uh, loads of gas you buying from Shell this week? And they said, well, we usually buy six. I said, I'll tell you what, you know, I'll sell it to you for 10 cents a gallon cheaper than them. I said, buy four from them, buy two from me. We'll bring it to you in the middle of the night. Nobody will know the difference. Well, before long, they want to buy all the gas from us because they're saving 10 cents a gallon, right? And we give them a receipt, all taxes included. So they had nothing to worry about. Uh, but I said, no, you can't do that. You still have to buy some from Shell. So everybody wanted gas from us. I mean, it wasn't like we had to force it on them. They wanted it. And then what we were doing, we were driving gas down at the pumps because we were working on, you know, at, at that time in the United States, you had nine cents 
uh, a gallon federal tax and 25 to 30 in state and local. So you had almost 40 cents a gallon. So if we're knocking off 10 cents, we still had another 30 cents to work with because we were keeping the tax money. So we were making a lot. And you save a gas station 10 cents a gallon, that's a big savings for them. So uh, believe me, we were the Robin Hoods uh, at that time of, of uh, the business. Everybody wanted to buy from us. How did you keep track of the books? I, Pelly and I were talking about this. Like, how did you keep track of the books? Like, there was no Excel spreadsheet at the time, right? So, how, how did you track this stuff? Well, you know, part of the part of the scam, the intricate part of the scam, was to holding the government off uh, from coming down on us because you were responsible to pay the tax quarterly, but we didn't pay it quarterly. But I had a team of accountants working, and we had I had bought a, a big. Uh, uh, a terminal from British Petroleum where we were able to store 3 million gallons and then we had gallons stored in different places. And there's a way to work this out so the government doesn't understand, you know, why we're not paying the tax. And you could get away with it for about 10 months, almost a year. And uh, so every day the register's ringing for that, you know, 12 months. And then when they finally come down on you, they come to an office, the office is closed down, the license is destroyed, and we moved on to the next license in another part of town. So they couldn't figure out what we were doing. They had no idea. It's super interesting stuff. Okay. So that's how you did it. I like your breakdown of that. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Now, at the same time, you were involved in the sports and entertainment business, correct? Yes. And you had a gambling operation with bookmakers, correct? Yeah, well, you know, again, I was the guy on Long Island. I had probably 12 or 13 bookmakers that were responsible to me. And the reason for that is very simple. A bookmaker, we wouldn't allow them to operate unless they were associated with us. They had to be. And number two, you know, a bookmaker takes credit. You know, you don't have to pay them. So they had collection issues or we were pretty good at collecting money. So they would come to us and we would help them. And then if they needed money, we would provide it to them. So every bookmaker that was able to take any kind of a sizable bet was associated with us. So I had 12 or 13 of them working with me and we had a lot of athletes and people around the sports that were gambling with us. And, uh, you know, that was an in for us to get to, to get involved in, uh, you know, compromising some kind of the outcome of, uh, uh, of sports competitions. Yeah, actually, I do want to ask you about that. So you had, you had athletes that were gambling with you and they end up compromised to a degree, right? Like how do athletes end up compromised? Well, you get an athlete that's, you know, with a major sports team or a college team. Let's let's take pros because uh, obviously that's you know, the biggest stakes involved. And, uh, you know, they're into you for $250,000, $300,000, right? I mean, I had a bookmaker would come to me and say, Michael, so-and-so from the Mets or the Jets, they're into us for fifty grand. Should I cut them off? And I said, why would you cut them off? I said, all you're doing is writing an entry on a piece of paper. Let them get, let them get into you for a half a million bucks, 250 grand, then bring them to me. So they'd come to me and I'd say, look, you owe me 200 grand. How are you going to pay? Because you've got a gambling debt, you're going to pay. Whether it be legal or illegal, you know, you go to Vegas, you have a debt, you're going to pay. So I said, how are you going to pay me? Well, you know, I said, I'll tell you what, you're a great athlete. I love your team. I said, you don't have to pay me all at once. You pay me three points a week five points a week, you know, on the money, be here every Monday. You got a game on Sunday, be here every Monday with the cash. I says, and take as long as you want to pay me back. Well, they'll say anything to get out of the room. And then, you know, for four, five, six, seven, eight weeks, they'll be paying you that VIG. But what are they doing? They're gamblers. Now they go across town, they're trying to gamble with somebody else to make up the loss that they have. And we know that, we have a network. So now all of a sudden they're in for you for five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. So now you bring them back and say, hey, What's going on? Let me tell you what you're going to do. You know, you're a quarterback, you know, first three times. I know what the spread is because remember, it's never about winning or losing. It's always about the spread. So you're a quarterback. Here's what I want you to do. The first three times you get the ball, you put it in the hand of the other receiver. You're a running back. First 22 times you get the ball, put it on the ground. I said, I'll worry about the rest. You do this for me. As long as I tell you, we'll make up the debt. That's how it goes. They don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. They're going to (laughs) pay. Well, you know, they know that, uh, listen, they know who they're talking to and they understand that we're not going to just let you walk out of the room and say, okay, you know, I'm sorry I made a mistake. You don't pay the debt. There's consequences. So, you know, they'll do what they need to do to make sure that that doesn't happen. Fascinating stuff. Really interesting. Did you, what about hockey was, I mean, we're in Canada, it's religion up here. Any hockey players? (laughs) Absolutely. And you know what? Um, Hockey, it's, it's, 
Let me tell you something. You have no idea. You know, I have spoken to Russian because I worked a lot with Major League Baseball, the NBA, all the pro sports. I have very good friends or not. As a matter of fact, the 12 o'clock appointment I have is with Bruce McNall. I don't know if you know who he is. He used of to course I know who Bruce McNall is. He's the one who, Wayne Gretzky, Gretzky, the Kings. Yes. Exactly. He's a very Let's bring dear him friend. on. Let's bring him on. I love I Bruce did John with Bruce. He's a very dear friend. And, uh, and another friend who used to own the, the Penguins, Howard. So, I mean, I, I have, uh, I have Dude, very good friends in hockey. You're right into the hockey world, Michael. Yes. This is fascinating. Of course, the Montreal Canadiens, clean as a whistle. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, is this, is this still happening now? Hey, Michael. Can I tell you this? You know how many Russian hockey players have told me that they're doing the bidding of some of their Russians, uh, you know, counterparts in, in Russia because they're afraid for their families? You know, so if they got to do something, they'll do it. They won't talk about it. Yeah. Because they're concerned. Do but you think it's still does, happening does, now? Does point shaving happen? Now? Absolutely. 100%. I mean, it hasn't gone away. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I think it, it's worse today in many ways because there's more access to gambling here in the States. I mean, you can go online now on your telephone. You can, you know, you can gamble. These guys get in trouble. They get in trouble. Yeah. I've heard rumors about certain Russian players and things like that. Um, it's funny you, you, you mentioned that. It's particularly the Russian players. Um, it's very not even their fault. I mean, these guys are, yeah. you know, they're extorted. Yeah. And they're, they're afraid to talk about it. I mean, it's, it's sad. It really is. Can you tell me just briefly about the operation involving boxing with Don King? You had something to do with Don King, didn't you? Yeah, you know, to make a very long story short, I had an under, undercover investigation on me where it was an undercover FBI agent posing as a wealthy Colombian guy who was once in the drug business but cleaned up his act and wanted to get into the fight game in a big way. And they were trying to infiltrate organized crimes involvement with the fight. So who's the big target? You know, me and Don King. And the investigation, actually, uh, the feds brought a guy out of prison um, who was very close with Muhammad Ali, who really knew the fight game. And these two guys come to me and I'm with them for seven or eight months. And they're trying to get me to take them to Don King so that they can make some kind of a deal. And meanwhile, they wired, they were wired and, you know, they had a lot of conversations with me. Uh, but I want to I want to add something to that. They, uh, they opened a bank account with $15 million in the bank in the Midwest. It was, it was a phony account, but the FBI set it up. And I do make the introduction with Don King after about seven or eight months that I'm, you know, feel comfortable with them. But I tell King at the meeting, I said, Don, I only know these guys eight months. In this first meeting, be legit. Don't say anything out of the way. Don't say anything wrong. I said, let's, let's take this along a little bit. King was perfect. You know, you would have thought he was, you know, the cleanest guy in the world. And, uh, you know, then we find out it's an undercover operation. But I want to tell you this. They had 83 tape recordings on me, 83, and they couldn't use one of them for an indictment. I never committed myself on the tape in the wrong way. So and that's my dad's. That's my dad's teaching. <laughs> Always be careful who you're talking to. Oh, I love it. That's, that's... The investigation fell apart. They, were, they couldn't get anything out of us, but uh, yeah. they tried. Wow. Sneaky good. Smart. Good. 83 recordings and couldn't use any of it. Yeah, you know who they got on the recordings? Al Sharpton, the River Al. I don't know if you know who he is, because he was my uh, he was my liaison to get to King. I, I used to send Sharpton up to talk to King, and yeah. he tried to make a drug deal with them, and they got him on tape and on video camera. He was the only guy, <laughs> and he became an informant as a result of that. Oh, interesting! Very yeah. interesting. Okay, so uh, eventually, though, the fun came to an end uh, in the 80s. You ended up indicted, right? In the RICO Act, that's the basis of Fear City, right? The new, uh, is it yeah. new documentary on Netflix? I, I yeah. watched the first episode. I did see your interview. I saw the first, I haven't watched the whole thing. Um, but what happened there? Like, what we, like, can you unpack that just a little bit? What happened with uh, in the 80s there and how you ended up actually caught? Well, you know, it, it, uh, Rudy Giuliani became the U.S. attorney in Manhattan. And he figured out how to use the racketeering law, which had been on the books for about 10 years. They just never used it. And um, they started to go after uh, people as part of a criminal enterprise. And it's a very, very tough law to defend. It's, it's, it's complicated in a way. And uh, I had three RICO indictments, actually, two federal and one state. And I, Giuliani indicted me in the early 80s, and I was acquitted in that case. But then in the gasoline case, you know, my partner became an informant. 
And I had saw what was going on in the life. I mean, they had convicted so many guys and they were giving them 100 years, 150 years, 70 years. I said, man, I'm the youngest guy out of all. They're going to give me 300 years if I get convicted on this case. So, you know, after I beat the Giuliani case, the government was pretty upset. They thought they had me on that one. So I had some leverage and I negotiated a deal on the whole gasoline racketeering case. 10 year sentence, $15 million in restitution. I had a plane and a helicopter there and I, had, I gave up all that. I surrendered some assets and, um, and went off to prison. Crazy. So you end up with a deal, you get out of prison and you leave the life at that point, right? That was it. You, you were done, right? Why? You, you know, no uh, urge to go back. Nothing was calling your name to come back to the life. Well, you, you know, it was it was the hardest decision I ever made in my life. I used to go to sleep, you know, leaving the life, wake up, going back in because, you know, I took an oath. I didn't want to betray my oath. I was so much in uh, a part of that life. I mean, that was my whole mentality. My dad was part of it. But what's happening is I'm seeing the destruction of the life. I'm seeing guys going away forever. I see what happened to my father. I saw my family, you know, mother, brothers and sisters get destroyed. And I said, I'm a major target. You know, that was my seventh indictment. I said, how many times am I going to beat them? And if I go down, I'm going to get 100 years. My life is over. I had met a young girl. She was, you know, I was, fell in love. I was going to marry her. I said, I'm going to marry this girl, then leave her as a, uh, you know, alone. It doesn't make sense. So I really saw that the life was in trouble, severe trouble. So I saw this as an exit. Now, I want to make this clear. I wasn't mad at anybody. Yeah, I'd gone through my stuff in that life. And you always have your, your treachery. But I wasn't mad at anybody. I didn't want to put anybody in trouble. I didn't want to take revenge. I just wanted out of the life. And so it was a real, you know, I mean, we'd be on for the next three hours. It was very excruciating and a real tightrope that I had to walk between the government and the guys on the street and my father to try to make the exit. And, you know, there's no blueprint for walking away from that life. So I didn't know if I was going to succeed or not. But fortunately, here I am. You know, the question everybody wonders is like, do you watch your back to this day or are you comfortable where you are? You know, you know, look, um, I never saw my former associates short, but everybody that I ran with is either dead or in prison for the rest of their life. Most of them dead. I mean, they're gone. You know, this life was devastated. I mean, out of that Fortune magazine list, uh, you know, at least 48 of them are dead. So, I mean, and that's only since 1986. So that's a short time for 48 people to be gone. And uh, I think the one or two that are left are in the 90s, you know, besides me. So they're gone. And it really, um, so not many guys survive, but the life is still there. I can't go back to Brooklyn and say, hey, guys, I'm moving back into the neighborhood. I mean, I wouldn't last 48 hours. I mean, that'd, that'd be thumbing my nose in their face. But, you know, I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. Just two days ago, I got a, a message. Hey, guys, Mike, there's rumbling in the street. People are mad at you. They're seeing you all over the place. But I've been hearing that for 30 years. It's nothing new. So my name is out there. So it's not like I let people forget about me. But I'm not going after the mob. You know, I mean, I'm doing my thing. I'm living my life the way I feel I need to live my life. So, you know, what could I tell you? Look, I'm 69 years old. I've made it this far. What am I going to stop doing what I'm doing now? I mean, you know, hopefully I understand what it is. And I'm not trying to hurt anybody. And that's it. Did the Netflix series change perspectives of people's minds? Uh, you know, it was very, I mean, it was the number one trending show for, you know, yeah, a funny thing when I saw the promo for the show, I said, man, how are they using my image in this? You know? So I called up my assistant and I said, Hey, what's going on with this Netflix deal? They got my image in there. And she said, uh, Michael, you interviewed for Netflix a year. It was a year ago that I had done. It. I forgot about it because I do so many of these things. And uh, so I, I forgot I did it, but it was the number one trending show. And then it lasted for several weeks. So I got a lot of feedback from it you know i i don't know if it changed people's minds i mean i thought it was done well you know they, they did a good job on it some things i thought were a little bit inaccurate but um you know look i have a television series right now that's in uh, heavy development on my life with a major production company i'm writing another book uh, it's actually a political book it's called a mafia democracy and it's really showing how our government in the United States has taken on this Mike, Machiavellian ideology in many ways, the same ideology that the mob had on the street. It's all about control. And, um, you know, I'm doing that and, you know, I'm all over YouTube. But again, I'm just doing my thing my way. I'm not trying to hurt anybody and I'm not trying to bring bad stuff on anybody. I'm just doing my thing. So 
Was there officially a hit on you or a, a contract out on your life officially? Yeah, there was. I mean, uh, Carmine Persico, who was my boss, uh, he took it very personal when I walked away. I mean, he was really upset. Um, you know, he and I were close at one point and, uh, you know, he was a, he was a pretty treacherous guy. I got to say he was an old timer. So yeah, I mean, it was a, now he had to put the hit on from prison. He had already been convicted on a mob commission case by Giuliani. So he was inside and there was a lot of stuff going on on the street. My father, you know, was upset with me, honestly. The feds told me he went along with the contract. So, I mean, I had, I had a, you know, I had some trouble for a while. You know, they locked me down in prison because the word was out that I was going to get killed. You know, I spent a lot of months in uh, solitary, a lot of years in solitary. And um, so I had, I had my share of challenges as a result, but I just outlasted everybody. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else is to tell you, you know? Yeah, you're a survivor. Um, okay, so let's move on to what you're doing now. You've written three books, I believe, right? Three books? Yeah. Uh, the most recent was, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse insider business tips from a former mob boss with some applications to legitimate business building and entrepreneurship. So I want to I wanna talk about that for a little bit as most of our listeners are business builders, sales professionals who negotiate for a living. So what's the main idea? of the book? Well, you know, I, I took, uh, when my publisher asked me to write the book, I, I said, look, there are a lot of guys out there um, that are very successful business people and probably can write a better book in that regard about the intricacies of business better than I can. Because, you know, the guys have said to me, people say, Michael, you are a brilliant businessman. And my response is, no, I wasn't. I wasn't a brilliant businessman because there's a lot of things within business that I didn't like to do and I knew I wouldn't do well. But I think I had two talents. Number one, I could recognize a good deal because I had deals coming to me all the time. I recognized a good deal. I was good in seeing trends and so on and so forth. And from that point, my philosophy was, Michael, do what you do best, delegate the rest. So I was very good at choosing the right people to do the right job and then motivating them to get the most out of them. That was my talent. You know, like when I had a Chevrolet agency and I had a Mazda agency, I had a leasing company. I didn't sit at the desk and run it, but I had the right people in place. They were responsible to me. I motivated them to do the good job. And we, we were very successful in that regard. How you know, you I was able them? to, you know, advise them if they had a question, you know, especially in a negotiation. So, you know, so I decided to write the book. I said, look, there's two ideologies in my view that I've lived by. The first one was Machiavellian. And we get that from the book, The Prince, that Machiavelli wrote. And I think everybody knows who he was, the 15th, 16th century, you know, philosopher uh, who in the, print, in the book, The Prince, he, he advised the prince how to maintain control of his kingdom. And that was kind of the philosophy that we worked under in the mob. When I became a person of faith, I was extremely uh, attracted to the book of Proverbs and Solomon, King Solomon. I thought he was the wisest man that ever lived. And when I started to read, I, it doesn't matter what faith you are. He was just a brilliant guy. And his, uh, his wisdom was amazing. So I kind of, I kind of uh, transferred from the Machiavellian philosophy to the Solomon philosophy. And I say, you can operate business both ways. You can be successful both ways, but Machiavelli is going to lead to ruin and Solomon can lead to longevity. And I wrote the book in that way, and I described the two philosophies all the way down the line, and it caught on. <laughs> and the wealthiest man who ever lived as well. King Solomon, absolutely. Yeah. So he must have been doing something right, right? <laughs> well, how are, you, how are you able to motivate your, your crew? You know, I, I think one of the things, you know, leadership, you know, we use the term leader. There's a difference between a leader and a boss. A boss you have to listen to because he's your superior. You don't have a choice. A leader you want to listen to because you've given him your, you've bought into his philosophy all the way. You know that whatever he asks you to do, he's capable of doing. He's never going to put you out front in something that he couldn't do himself. And, you know, you're a leader when people want to follow you. And so, you know, I used to get that way with my crew. I used to make them feel, you know, that they were important. I didn't degrade them. And I used to tell them that whatever I'm asking you to do, I'm ready to do also. And I can do as well or better. I'm going to motivate you to be better than me. And, and people like to hear that. You know, they're not in competition with you. They're learning from you. They're following you. And um, I, I guess, 
you know, I, it's, I think it's an innate quality that you have. And then you develop more as you get to know the, the personality of people and how to motivate them. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, when you were describing the structure of mob families, you talked about the concil- conciliary, right? The conciliary, conciliary. Yeah. Yeah, can, I say, can you explain the significance of how that might relate to entrepreneurship? Would you call that a mentor? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, yeah. it's always great to have somebody to run things off of, you know, and not a yes man. This has got to be somebody that is willing to tell you, hey, you're wrong. OK, and here's why. Now, you may not follow him, but at least you're going to hear what he has to say. And maybe it will play into the final decision that you make. But it's always good to have somebody to bounce things off of. And that's that's Solomon's philosophy also. You know, I can name Proverbs where he tells you that, you know, in war, it's better to have an advisor than to go through it alone. So it's very important to have somebody that you can run off. Because, look, you don't know everything in life. I mean, there's people, you know, that that I sit down and, and I'll listen to and I'll absorb everything they have to say until this moment. And I may apply it through my own vision, but I'll listen. You know, you know, what's interesting is I, th- I think King Solomon knew that too, right? That's why he prayed for wisdom. He knew he didn't have all the answers. He was actually, he humbled himself before God, you know, to ask for wisdom. And because he was found favorable by God for asking for wisdom and not riches, he gave him riches as well. Very interesting. Like, uh, you know what I mean? Like very interesting figure in history. You know, the interesting thing too, is I had a, uh, you know, I do a lot of coaching, life coaching and business coaching. And I tell people all the time, you know, you're going to run your business pretty much the same way you run your life. If you're organized and you run your life in a successful way, your, your business will reflect that many times. And, um, you know, one young man that I was coaching the other day, I told him, he said, you know, he's very successful. Young guy, 22 years old. His business is already doing 220 grand to 250 a month. And he started this when he was 19, you know, online, obviously, but very, very. And he said, Michael, you know, I'm getting a lot of praise. How do you keep this from going to your head and, you know, having an ego? And I said, I wanted to tell you something. I said, humility in life is a lot more attractive than egotism. I said, you're going to be humble because you've got to remember in this life, everything can vanish in a second. Maybe sickness, maybe an accident, maybe something happens, you know, a tidal wave, everything could be gone. I said, it's, it's a lot more attractive to be humble. I said, but don't, don't mistake humility for a lack of confidence. You can show confidence without having an ego. And if you're smart, your confidence should, should always glare. It should always be out front. People should see this is a confident guy. I want to follow him. And I think that's a real quality of leadership to show people that you're confident in what you're doing. Man, I couldn't agree more. It's a really profound comment. Um, you also talk about learning from your failures because failures can teach you lessons uh, you won't learn from any other source. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. And look, and I, I have failed in business. You know, I've made mistakes, um, but I always learn from them. You know, my wife, you know, she says to me all the time, you know, you're the most optimistic guy that I've ever met, because if something goes wrong, I I just it's done. You know, I've done what I can. It's done. And I move on. I've learned from it and I go on. I don't look at failures as disasters because um, I hate when I make a mistake. Don't get me wrong, but I know I'm capable of making a mistake. So what what am I going to do? I mean, a lot less now, because if I'm still making them at this age, something's really wrong. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I tell people all the time, you know, you learn from your failures. um, and I think you have to fail sometimes because if you, you know, if you never fail, what are you going to learn? I mean, that's how I look at it. And uh, I do a whole chapter in the book. I get a lot more into that because I think it's important for people not to get down when they fail. I see guys fail and it's the end of the world. I said, well, you know, I, I, I don't see, the, we're not at your funeral. This is not a cemetery, you know, so let's pack up and let's move on, you know, and that's how we do it. So tying into that, what is, what is the biggest, it's a, a double question, what, what is the biggest problem new entrepreneurs are going through right now that, that you see? And what is one of the solutions if, or advice you could give to them? You know, it's crazy that uh, I get so many comments. The biggest, this is, I didn't even expect this, but the biggest comment I'm getting from younger people today, young entrepreneurs, is I can't self-motivate. I can't get myself motivated. I can't get off the carpet. And it's, it's so prevalent recently. And I'm saying, but why is that? You know, is it, is it because of the internet that people don't get out and do things anymore? They sit in their house. I mean, I haven't figured it out yet. Don't get me wrong. But it's one of the biggest issues that I'm seeing with young entrepreneurs motivating themselves to do better. Like I'm stuck in a rut. I've got to this point, but I can't go any further. I just can't motivate myself. I heard, I've heard that so often. And, uh, you know, obviously I talked to them about motivation. 
But I'm wondering, you know, myself, why I'm hearing that so much. And I, I think, think it has it to have some way, something to do with online. It has to, with social media and all that. It has to. I mean, people don't get out and do things anymore. Sit at their desk and they're looking on the, you know, his computer all the time or their phone. Right. Yeah. Right. They feel paralyzed. Yeah. It's, it's made, um, you know, I've got, I'm not saying my, my daughters fall into this category, but I'm just saying, you know, they've made it easy. Like they haven't faced the same difficulties like my generation, your generation faced, et cetera. Like we actually had to like, defend ourselves to a degree you know we we, we didn't you know we we didn't have to um now you can turtle you're so protected you could just not go to school not talk to a teacher not you know all of these things so you don't have adversity and the other thing is too i, I feel like you know the youth of today they don't they don't know why they're doing something like they don't have their why in front of them or you know in terms of motivation you always have that you know that vision in front of you where this is leading to and i think sometimes that's missing in the younger generation personally yeah, and so many of them, you know, they don't they don't know how to really converse anymore. I mean, I had I had to reprimand my daughter. You know, she's downstairs, uh, twenty feet away from me, and she's texting me. I said, "Excuse me." I said, "Raise your voice, and I'll hear you." I'm only upstairs. <laughs> Why are you texting me? You know, because I see it. She said, "Daddy, you're not answering me." I said, "I got my phone in my hand, looking." You're downstairs, you know. But that's it. That's it. I hear that all the time too. You know, like my, my son, Michael, he's 31 years old now. He doesn't like to get on the phone. Text, 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 text. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, there's a certain distance that you're creating between yourself and people when it's a text. You don't know how to converse. Yep. And I, I even right. tell them, how are you going to negotiate with somebody if you never talk to anybody yeah. about something important where it's always in a text? And I think that's a real issue with, with our younger generation. I really do. I feel that there's also something that has to do with them feeling that Everything has to be perfect all the time. Everything that comes out of their mouth has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. If they if they um, if they try out for whatever activity or business venture, they're scared of failure. They don't know how to put this in perspective that it's actually you have to go through it. You have to say the wrong thing sometimes at the wrong time, and sometimes you have to fail to get to where you need to go. Yeah, well, you know, my my son once said to me, "Well, Dad, you didn't fail in that much." I said, "I didn't fail." I said, "I went to prison for ten years. You don't call that a failure." I said, well, I gave up my plane, my helicopter. I went to jail. I was in the hole. I said, you don't consider that a failure? That's a major failure. Wow. I said, you, you lose your freedom because of things that you did in your life. That's a big failure. I said, I've failed plenty of times. Yeah, but look at you now. I said, well, that's because I worked to get it back. I said, this didn't just, I didn't just sit here and everything came falling in my lap. I said, you got to work. Yeah, you what's, your, what's your son's name? His name is Michael. Michael. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You try it, Michael Jr. You try it. Um, <laughs> anyways, okay. So what does success mean to Michael Francis? Well, success today is certainly different than it was, you know, when I was in the mob and I, you know, everything was, it wasn't so much the money because the money was always a byproduct of everything that I did. But yeah, I wanted to accumulate money. I wanted to be wealthy. You know, today it's all about being comfortable, having nobody, you know, on my back looking to send me to prison or looking to hurt me in any way, uh, enjoying my family. And I, I think, you know, just being comfortable. I want to go on vacation, I can go. Uh, you know, I want to buy a new car, I can buy a new car. You know, uh, th this is what's comfortable to me. And that's what's successful to me. I have a family around me and, and it means everything. That's awesome. And if you had the chance to do it over again, would you? Go into the mob? You know, I get asked that and it's such a tough question because uh, I mean, I don't, I, I regret some of the things that I did in that life, obviously. You know, when you're a criminal and you're committing crimes and sometimes serious things, I regret them. But, you know, that life helped form who I am today. Had I not been a part of that, everybody said, well, you would have been a success or whatever you did. I don't know that because I don't have a crystal ball and I'm not vain enough to say, well, I would have been good no matter what I did. I don't know, you know, in, in that direction. So, I mean, I regret some of the things that I did in that life, but I think if this is exact same circumstance came up, I would probably do it again. Mm. And I may get take some flack for that, but uh, I'm being honest. <laughs> Interesting. What do you do for fun, Michael? Uh, I love golfing. Oh, okay. I love it. Uh, tomorrow I'm going up to Napa Valley with my wife and two of my kids, and we're going to do some wine tasting and eat great. We love to go out to dinner. We love to vacation. I mean, that's, uh, and we love just having a family around, you know, we, uh, we make Sundays and holidays for sure. Family day. Uh, I play racquetball 
That's how I stay somewhat in shape. So these are the things that I enjoy. Hey, listen, we've got some world-class golf courses in Montreal here. World-class. Uh, when you come up here, we'll take you to, uh, we'll take him to Country Club Montreal, right, Pelly? Yeah, take him to Country Club great. Montreal. That's good golf. Um, <laughs> now, real quick, you, you do watch mob movies. I know this. Uh, you had honorable mention in Goodfellas, one of the most iconic gangster movies of all time. How realistic are those movies? Like, is, is Goodfellas realistic? Uh, the, the three most realistic movies, when I say realistic, uh, the authenticity of the movie, the, the portrayal of the life, uh, the dialogue, the characters, the way they carried it off, uh, and somewhat the stories were, you know, fairly accurate. There's always dramatic liberty that's taken, but fairly accurate. And, all, and don't forget, you're always looking at this story through the eyes of the person that's writing it. So like with Goodfellas, Henry Hill... A lot of things he said, you know, you can rely on some and not all. But it was very authentic in the portrayal. And a lot of things that happened, yes, it was, it was probably one of the most authentic films. Donnie Brasco, same thing. Pacino was amazing in that movie. He was terrific. You know, I knew all those guys. I knew both guys. And then, and then the last one that, I, that nobody really knows about, but I bring it out all the time. It's the Gotti movie uh, that HBO produced in 1991 with Armand DeSante and Anthony Quinn. Brilliant movie, extremely accurate. Uh, most of that movie was taken right off of the, uh, the surveillance tapes that were on Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero at the time. And I was, I was pretty closely involved in, in hearing some, some of those tapes, another whole story, but brilliantly done. If you haven't watched that movie, go on YouTube and pick it up. HBO's Gotti. Armand DeSante was done in 1991. You'll love it. I want to tell you this. Yeah. You are the very first interview that my wife ever recommended me to do. Three some odd years. I don't know why. Well, it's because, well, A, we have one of the top entrepreneur podcasts on the planet, apparently. And, uh, and secondly, Camille, thank you very much. Michael, Please, thank you very much, Michael. Really appreciate your time. I really do, man. You guys were great. And uh, we'll you, see you next time. Thank you, Michael. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you.